No. Okay. Okay, so that's Nicole, everybody. And she's playing <laughs> Margaret. We'll get back to you. Why am I dropping things? Hi, I'm Jeff Merriman. I'm playing Leonato. I'm Colin Brock. I'll be Jonathan Donathan. Wait, Don John. <laughs> This is going great. <laughs> Hi, I'm Renata, and I'm playing Harrow. Our hero, your pick. <laughs> Up for interpretation. I'm, <laughs> I'm Karen Folda, and I'm playing Ursula. Uh, Mark Mendelson, I'm playing Don Pedro. Oh. <laughs> I'm Katie. I'm playing the messenger. <laughs> Catherine? Catherine? I don't have a high. Oh. My name is Kat DeBlue, and I'm going to be doing Sexton. <laughs> Eric Domeray, I'm playing Benedict. Ah. I'm Melissa Huckabee, and I'm playing Beatrice. Mary Ann <laughs> Watchman 2. Oh, more people joined. Good. Uh, yeah, that's, I'm that's me, <coughs> Nicole, by audio. So I could have um, oh, better audio here. Okay. Awesome. All right. uh, I'm Seth Ramsey, and I'm playing Claudio. And then your name is on there, too. <laughs> I'm Sandra Ramsey. I'll be playing Balthazar. Ooh. Hi, I'm Roderick. I'm going to be playing Baraccio. My name is John Wayne, and I'm going to be Conrad. Hi, I'm Helen, and I'm going to be playing Watchman One. Hi, I'm Ethan Grossclose, and I'll be playing Boy. <laughs> And I'm Rebecca Bernstein, and I'll be doing Burgess. All right, guys, whenever Leonato and Messenger are ready, let's up. I'm good to go. I'm good. <clears throat> start. Damn, how the hell do we read this? I learn in this letter that Don Peter of Aragon comes this night to Messina. He is very nearby this. He was not three leagues off when I left him. How many gentlemen have you lost in this action? But few of any sort, and none of name. <laughs> a victory is twice itself when the achiever brings home full numbers. I find here that Don Peter hath bestowed much honor on a young Florentine called Claudio. Much deserved on his part, and equally remembered by Don Pedro. He hath borne himself beyond the promise of his age, doing in the figure of a lamb the feats of a lion. He hath indeed better bettered expectation than you must expect of me to tell you how. He had an uncle here in Messina. will be very much glad of it. I have already delivered him letters, and there appears much joy in him, even so much that joy could not show itself modest enough without a badge of bitterness. <laughs> Did he break out in tears? In great measure. <laughs> a kind overflow of kindness. Uh, there are no faces truer than those that are so washed. Uh, how much better is it to weep at joy than joy at weeping? I pray you, is Signor Montanto returned from the wars or no? I know none of that name, lady. There was none such in the army of any sort. What is he that you ask for, niece? My cousin means Signor Benedict of Padua. Oh, he's returned, and as pleasant as ever he was. He set up his bills here in Messina and challenged Cupid at the flight. And my uncle's fool, reading the challenge, subscribed for Cupid and challenged him at the bird bolt. I pray you, how many hath he killed and eaten in these wars? But how many hath he killed? For indeed, I promise to eat all of his killing. Um, Faith, Nate, you <clears throat> tax Signor Benedict too much, uh, but he'll meet with you, I doubt it not. He hath done good service, lady, in these wars. You had musty victual, and he hath helped to eat it. He is a very valiant trencherman. He hath an excellent stomach. And a good soldier, too, lady. And a good soldier to a lady. But what is he to a lord? A lord to a lord, a man to a man, stuffed with all honorable virtues. It is so, indeed. He is no less than a stuffed man. But for the stuffing, well, we are all mortal. 
you must not, sir, mistake my niece. There is a kind of merry war between Signor Benedict and her. They're never met, but there's a skirmish of wit between them. Alas, he gets nothing by that. In our last conflict, four of his five wits went halting off, and now is the whole man governed with one, so that if he have wit enough to keep himself warm, let him bear it for a difference between himself and his horse, for it is all the wealth that he hath left to be known a reasonable creature. Who is his companion now? He hath every month a new sworn brother. Is this possible? Very easily possible. He wears his faith, but as the fashion of his hat, it ever changes with the next block. I see, lady, the gentleman is not in your books. No, and he were, I would burn my study. But I pray you, who is his companion? Is there no young squarer now that will make a voyage with him to the devil? He is most in the company of the right noble Claudio. Oh, Lord, he will hang upon him like a disease. He is sooner caught than the pestilence, and the taker runs presently mad. God help the noble Claudio. If he hath caught the Benedict, it will cost him a thousand pound ere I be cured. I will hold friends with you, lady. Do, good friend. You will never run mad, niece. No, not till a hot January. Ah, Don Pedro is approached. Good, Signor Leonardo, you are come to meet your trouble. The fashion of the world is to avoid cost, and you encounter it. Never came trouble to my house in the likeness of your grace. For trouble being gone, comfort should remain. But when you depart from me, sorrow abides and happiness takes its leave. You embrace your charge too willingly. I think this is... Her mother hath many times told me so. Were you in doubt, sir, that you asked her? <laughs> Signor Benedict, no, for then you were a child. You have it full, Benedict. You may guess by this what you are, being a man. Truly, the lady fathers herself. Be happy, lady, for you are like an... If Signor Leonardo be her father, she would not have had, she would not have his head on her shoulders for all of Messina, as like him as she is. I wonder that you will still be talking, Signor Benedict. Nobody marks you. What? My dear Lady Disdain. Are you yet living? Is it possible Disdain should die while she have such meat food to feed it as Signor Benedict? Courtesy itself must convert to disdain if you come in her presence. Then is courtesy a turncoat. But it is certain I am loved of all ladies. Only you accepted. And I would I could find in my heart that I had not a hard heart, for truly, I love none. A dear happiness to women. They would else have been troubled with a pernicious suitor. I thank God in my cold blood. I am of your humor for that. I had rather hear my dog bark at a crow than a man swear he loves me. God keep your ladyship still in that mind. So some gentleman or other shall scape a predestinate scratched face. Scratching, scratching could not make it worse, and twere such a face as yours were. Well, you are a rare pair of teacher. A bird of my tongue is better than a beast of yours. I would my horse at the speed of your tongue, and a good, and a, so, a, so good a continuer, but keep your way in God's name, I have done. You always end with the jade's trick. I know you of old. This is the sum of all, Leonato. When Signor Benedict, my dear friend Leonardo, had invited you all, I tell him we shall stay here at least a month, and he heartily prays some occasion may detain us longer. I dare swear secret for praise from his heart. If you swear, my lord, you shall not be forsworn. Let me bid you welcome, my lord. Being reconciled to the prince, your brother, I owe you all duty. I thank you. I am not of many words, but I thank you. <laughs> Please it your grace to lead on. And Leonardo, we'll go together. Benedict. Tell me not the daughter of Signor Leonardo. I noted her not, but I looked on her. Is she not a modest young lady? Do you question me as an honest man should do for my simple true judgment? Or would you have me speak after my custom as being professed tyrant to their sex? <laughs> no, I, I pray thee, speak in sober judgment. Hmm. 
Why, Faith, you think she too low for a high praise, <laughs> too brown for fair praise, and too little for a great praise. Only this commendation I can afford her that were she other than she is, she were unhandsome. And being no other than she is, I do not like her. Thou thinkest I am in sport. I pray thee, tell me truly how thou likest her. Would you buy her that you inquire after her? <laughs> Can the world buy such a jewel? Yeah, and a case to put it into. But speak of this with a sad brow, or do you play the flouting jack to tell us Cupid is a good hair finder and Vulcan a rare carpenter? Come in, what key shall a man take you to go in the song? In mine eyes, she is the sweetest lady that ever I looked on. I can see yet without spectacles, and I need to see no such matter. There's a cousin, and she were not possessed with a fury, exceeds her as much in beauty as the first of May, that the last of December. <laughs> I hope you have no intent to turn husband, have you? I would scarce trust myself. No, I have sworn the cons contrary. Hero would be my wife. Has it come to this? In faith, hath not the world one man, but he will wear his cap without suspicion? Shall I never see a bachelor of three score again? Uh, go to a faith, and thou wilt needs thirst thy neck into thrust thy neck into a yoke, wear the print of it, sigh away some days. Look, Don Pedro is returned to seek you. What secret hath held you here that you followed not to Leonardo's? Thy word, your grace, would constrain me to tell. I charge thee on thy allegiance. You hear, Count Claudio? I can be secret as a dumb man. I would have you think so, but on my allegiance, mark you this, on my allegiance, he is in love. With who? Now that is your grace's part, mark how short his answer is. With hero, Leonardo's short daughter. If this were so, so it were uttered. It's like the old tale, my lord. Tis, uh, it is not so, nor twas not so, but indeed, God forbid it should be so. If my passion change not shortly, God forbid it should be otherwise. Amen, if you love her. For the lady is very well worthy. You speak this to fetch me in, my lord. On that troth, I speak my thought. And in faith, my lord, I spoke mine. And by my two faiths and troths, my lord, I spoke mine. That I love her, I, I feel. That she is worthy, I know. That I neither feel how she should be loved nor know how she should be worthy is the opinion that fire cannot melt out of me. I will die in it at the stake. Thou was ever an obstinate heretic in the despite of me. And never could maintain his part but in the force of his will. That a woman conceived me. I thank her that she brought me up. I likewise give her most humble thanks. But that I will have a reach winded in my forehead or hang my bugle in an invisible baldric, all women shall pardon me, because I will not do them wrong to mistrust any. I will do myself the right to trust none. And the fine is, for the which I may go the finer, I will live a bachelor. I shall see thee, ere I die, look pale with love. <laughs> <laughs> with anger. With sickness, or with hunger, my lord, not with love. Prove that ever I lose more blood with love than I will get again with drinking. Pick out mine eyes with a ballad maker's pen and hang me up at the door of a brothel house for the sign of blind Cupid. <laughs> well, if ever thou dost fall from this faith, thou will prove a notable argument. If I do, hang me in a bottle like a cat and shoot at me, and he that hits me, let him be clapped on the shoulder and called Adam. 
Well, as time shall try, in time the savage bull doth bear the young. The savage bull may, but if ever the sensible Benedict bear it, pluck off the bull's horns and set them in my forehead, and let me be vilely painted, and in such great letters as they write, here is good horse to hire. Let them signify under my sign, here you may see Benedict the Merry Man. If this should ever happen, thou wouldst be a horn mad. Nay, if Cupid have not spent all his quiver in Venice, thou wilt quake for this shortly. <laughs> I look for an earthquake too, then. Well, you temporize with the hours. In the meantime, good Signor Benedict, repair to Leonardo. Send me to him and tell him I will not fail him at supper, for indeed he hath made great preparation. I have almost matter enough in me for such an embassage, and so I commit you. To the tuition of God, from my house, if I had it. The 6th of July, your loving friend, Benedict. Nay, mock not, mock not. The body of your discourse is sometime guarded with fragments, and the guards are but slightly basted on neither. Ere you flout old ends any further, examine your conscience. So I leave you. My liege, your highness may not do me good. My love is thine to teach it but how. And thou shalt see how apt it is to learn any hard lesson that may do thee good. Hath Leonardo any son, my lord? No child but hero. She's his only heir. Dost thou affect her, Claudio? Oh, my lord, when you went onward on this ended action, I looked upon her with soldier's eyes. That liked but had a rougher task in hand than to drive liking to the name of love. But now I'm returned, and that war thoughts have left their places vacant, and their rooms come thronging soft and delicate desires, all prompting me how fair young hero is, saying I liked her ere I went to wars. <laughs> Thou wilt be like a lover presently, and tire the hero with a book of words. If thou dost love fair hero, cherish it, and I will break with her and with her father, and thou shalt have her. Was it not to this end that thou beganest to twist so story? How sweetly you do minister to love, that no love's complexion. But lest my liking might too sudden seem, I would have salved it with longer treaties. What needs the bridge much broader than the flood? The fairest grant is the necessity. Look, what will serve is fit. Tis once, thou and I will fit thee with the remedy. I know we shall have reveling tonight. I will assume thy part in some disguise and tell fair hero that I am Claudio and in her bosom of unclad heart and take her hearing prisoner with the forced and strong encounter of my amorous tale. Then after to her father will I break. And the conclusion is she shall be thine. In practice, let us put it presently. So this is the scene we are skipping, is that correct? Yes. Okay. So straight to Conrad. Yeah. Stand by, let's get John. John, you ready? Yes. All right, cool. Where are we stepping now? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, scene three. Scene three. Mm -hmm. Rebecca, I just have. I'm sorry. I must have skipped scene scene three. Okay. Um. So we're going straight from. Um, oh, I got it. I got it. I'm sorry. No, you're good. So, John, we're going to pick up on what the good year, my lord. Yeah, I guess I must have skipped that part. I'm trying to find it. Hold up. No, you're good. It's on the, uh, the text, I think, or the link here. Let me post the link again for you. Yeah, yeah scene two is quite short. Yeah, it's easy it's to it. skip. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Too far. Yeah. Good. Sorry. Right. 
You got it? I'm still looking through. Yeah. If you want to click the link that I sent, you can go straight down to um, okay. scene three. Ooh. Yeah, that's what I do. Oof. Okay, um, maybe a different document. Um, let's see. Uh, let me pull it up on the Facebook real quick. Okay. Ah, I see. Okay, okay cool. I'm ready. And... What the good year, my lord? And why are you thus out of measure sad? There is no measure in the occasion that breeds, therefore the sadness is without limit. You should hear reason. And when I have heard it, what blessing brings it? <laughs> if not a present remedy, at least a patient sufferance. I wonder that thou, being as thou sayest thou art, born under Saturn, goest about to apply a moral medicine to a mortifying mischief. I cannot hide what I am. I must be sad when I have cause and smile at no man's jests, eat when I have stomach and wait for no man's leisure, sleep when I am drowsy and tend on no man's business, and laugh when I am merry and claw no man in his humor. Yay. Yea, but you must not make the full show of this till you must do it wi without controlment. You have of late stood out against your brother, and he hath taken you newly into his grace, where it is impossible you should take true root but by the fair weather that you make yourself. It is needful that you frame the season for your own harvest. I had rather be a canker in a hedge than a rose in his grace, and it better fits my blood to be disdained of all than to fashion a carriage to rob love from any. In this, though, I cannot be said to be a flattering, honest man. It must not be denied that I am a plain-dealing villain. I am trusted with a muzzle and enfranchised with a clog. Therefore, I have decreed not to sing in my cave. If I had a mouth, I would bite. If I had my liberty, I would do my liking. In the meantime, let me be that I am and seek not to alter me. Can you make no use of your discontent? I make all use of it for I use it only. Who comes here? <sighs> what news, Baraccio? I come yonder from a great supper. The prince, your brother, is royally entertained by Leonardo, and I can give you intelligence of an intended marriage. Will it serve any model to build mischief on? Huh? What is he for a fool that betrays himself to unquietness? Mary, it is your brother's right hand. Who, the most exquisite Claudia? Even he. A proper squire, and who? And who? Which way looks he? Mary on Hero, the daughter and heir of Leonardo. A very forward march chick. How came you to this? Being entertained for a perfumer. As I was smoking a musty room, comes me the prince and Claudio, hand in hand in sad conference. I whipped me behind the arras, and there heard it agreed upon that the prince shall woo Hero for himself, and having obtained her, give her to Count Claudio. Come, come, let us visit. This may prove food to my displeasure. That young startup hath all the glory of my overthrow. If I can cross him in any way, I bless myself every way. You both are sure and will assist me. To the death, my lord. Let us to the great supper. Their cheer is the greater that I am subdued. With the cook were of my mind. Shall we go prove what's to be done? We'll wait upon your lordship. Was Count John here at supper? Did Antonio answer? I did not hear. <clears throat> okay. I saw not. How tartly that gentleman looks. 
I never can see him, but I am heartburned an hour after. He is of a very melancholy disposi disposition. You were an excellent man that were, that were made just in the midway between him and Benedict. The one is too like an image and says nothing, and the other too like my lady's eldest son, ever more tattling. <laughs> then half Signor Benedict's tongue and count John's mouth, and <laughs> half count John's melancholy in Signor Benedict's face. <laughs> With a good leg and a good foot, uncle, and money enough in his purse, such a man would win any woman in the world if it could get her goodwill. <laughs> By truth, niece. Thou will never uh, get thee a husband if thou be so shrewd of thy tongue. In faith, she's too cursed. Too cursed is more than cursed. I shall lessen God's sending that way. For it is said, God sends a cursed cow short horns, but to a cow too cursed he sends none. So by being too cursed, uh, God will send you no horns. Just if he send me no husband. For the which blessing I am at him upon my knees every morning and evening, Lord. I could not endure a husband with a beard on his face. I had rather lie in the woolen. Oh, you may lie on a husband that hath no beard. What should I do with him? Dress him in my apparel and make him my waiting gentlewoman? He that hath a beard is more than a youth, and he that hath no beard is less than a man. And he that is more than a youth is not for me. And he that is less than a man, I am not for him. Therefore, I will even take sixpence in earnest of the bear ward and lead his apes into hell. Well, then go you into hell. No, but to the gate. And there will the devil meet me like an old cuckold with horns on his head and say, get you to heaven, Beatrice, get you to heaven. Here's no place for you maids. So deliver I up my apes, look okay. <laughs> and away to St. Peter for the heavens. He shows me where the bachelors sit and there we live we as merry as the day is long. Well, niece, I trust you will be ruled by your father. Yes, Faith. It is my cousin's duty to make curtsy and save father as it please you. But yet for all that cousin, let him be a handsome fellow, or else make another curtsy and say, father, as it please me. Well, niece, I hope to see you one day fitted with a husband. Not till God make men of some other metal than earth. Would it not grieve a woman to be overmastered with a pierce of valiant dust, to make an account of her life to a clod of wayward moral? No, uncle, I'll none. Adam's sons are my brethren, and truly, I hold it a sin to match in my kindred. Daughter, remember what I told you. If the prince do solicit you in that kind, you know the answer. The fault will be in the music, cousin, if you be not wooed in good time. If the prince be too important, tell him there is measure in everything and so dance out the answer. For hear me, hero, wooing, wedding, and repenting is as a scotch jig, a measure and a sink pace. The first suit is hot and hasty like a scotch jig and full as fantastical. The wedding, mannerly modest as a measure, full of state and ancientry. And then comes repentance and with his bad legs falls into the sink pace faster and faster till he his grave. Cousin, you apprehend passing shrewdly. I have a good eye, uncle. I can see a church by daylight. The revelers are entering. Uh, brother, make good room. <clears throat> Pedro? Oh, here. Oh, you're muted. There you go. Lady! Lady! Will you walk about with your friend? So you walk softly and look sweetly and say nothing. I'm yours for the walk, and especially when I walk away. With me in your company? I may say so, when I please. And when you please to say so? When I like your favor, for God to fin the loot should be like the case. My visor is Philemon's roof. Within the house is Joe. Why then, your visor should be thatched. Speak low, if you speak low. Well, I would you did like me. So would not I, for your own sake, for I have many ill qualities. Which is one? <laughs> I say my prayers aloud. <laughs> I love you the better. The tears may cry, Amen! God matched me with a good dancer. Amen!
and God keep him out of my sight when the dance is done. Answer, clerk. Oh, no more words. The clerk is answered. I know you well enough. You are Signor Antonio. At a word, I am not. I know you by the waggling of your head. To tell you true, I counterfeit him. You could never do him so ill well unless you were the very man. Here's his dry hand up and down. You are he. You are he. At a word, I am not. Come, come, do you think I do not know you by your excellent wit? Can virtue hide itself? Go to mom, you are he. Graces will appear and there's an end. Will you not tell me who told you so? No, you shall pardon me. Nor will you not tell me who you are? Not now. That I was disdainful and that I had my good wit out of the hundred merry tales. Well, this was Signor Benedict that said so. What's he? I'm sure you know him well enough. Not I, believe me. Did he ever make you laugh? I pray you, what is he? Why, he is the prince's jester, a very dull fool. Only his gift is in devising impossible slanders. None but libertines delight in him, and the commendation is not wit, but in his villainy, for he both pleases men and angers them, and then they laugh at him and beat him. I am sure he is in the fleet. I, I would he had boarded me. When I know the gentleman, I'll tell him what you say. Do, do. He'll but break a comparison or two on me, which her adventure not marked or not laughed at strikes him into melancholy. And then there's a partridge wing saved, for the fool will eat no supper that night. We must follow the leaders. In every good thing. Nay, if they lean any ill, I will leave them at the next turning. Sure, my brother is amorous on hero and hath withdrawn her father to break with him about it. The ladies follow her and but one visor remains. I'm not paying for that. So much for pork to Gino. <laughs> we get her off caffeine, no poisoner. And Baraccio. We're at Baraccio. Oh, we're at Baraccio? I thought we were at Don John. Sure. You want to give? Yeah, take that again, if you if you would, Colin. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. My brother's amorous son here and hath withdrawn with her father to break with him about it. The ladies follow her, and but one visor remains. And that is Claudio. I know him by his bearing. Are not you, Signor Benedict? You know me well. I am he. Signor, you are very near my brother in his love. He is enamored on hero. I pray you dissuade him from her. She is no equal to his birth. You may do the part of an honest man. In it. How do you know he loves her? I heard him swear his affection. So did I too. And he swore he would marry her tonight. Come, let us to the banquet. Thus answer I in the name of Benedict, but hear these ill news with the ears of Claudio. Tis certain so. The prince woos for himself. Friendship is constant in all other things, save in the office and affairs of love. Therefore, all hearts in love use their own tongues. Let every eye negotiate for itself and trust no agent. For beauty is a witch against whose charms faith and melleth into blood. This is an accident of hourly proof, which I must trust did not. Farewell, therefore, hero. Now, Claudio? Yes, the same. Tom, um, will you go with me? Whither? Even to the next willow about your own business, country. What fashion will you wear the garland of about your neck like a user's chain or under your arm like a lieutenant's scarf? You must wear it one way, for the prince hath got your hero. I wish him joy of her. Well, that's spoken like an honest drovier, so they sell bullocks. Did you think the prince would have served you thus? I pray you leave me. Whoa, whoa. now you strike at the blind man, was the boy that stole your meat, and you'll beat the post. If it will not be, I'll leave you. Ah, huh. alas, poor hurt fowl. Now will he creep into the sedges, but then Lady Beatrice should know me and not know me? The prince's fool? <laughs> it may be I go under that title because I marry, yea, so, but so I am apt to do myself wrong. 
I am not so reputed. It is the base, though bitter, disposition of Beatrice that puts the world into her person, so gives me out. Now, I'll be revenged as I may. Now, Signor, where's the Count? Did you see him? Troth, my lord, I have played the part of Lady Fame. I found him here as melancholy as a lodge in a warrior. I told him, and I think I told him true, that your grace had got the good will of this young lady, and I offered him my company to a willow tree, either to make him a garland as being forsaken, or to bind him up a rod as being worthy to be whipped. To be whipped? What's his fault? The flat transgression of a schoolboy who, being overjoyed with finding a bird's nest, shows it his companion, and he steals it. Will thou make a trust? <laughs> Yet it had not been amiss the rod had been made, and the garland too, for the garland he might have worn himself, and the rod he might have bestowed on you, who, as I take it, have stolen his bird's nest. Uh, I will teach them to sing, restore them to the owner. Sounds awesome. good to me. Okay. Go ahead. I will teach them to sing and restore them to the owner. If they're singing answer your saying, by my faith, you say honestly. The Lady Beatrice hath a quarrel to you. The gentleman that danced with her told Oh, she misused oh, me, she is much the wrong by it. Block. An oak, but with one green leaf on it, would have answered her. My very visor began to assume life and scold with her. She told me, not thinking I had been myself, that I was the prince's jester, that I was duller than a great thaw, huddling jest upon jest with such impossible conveyance upon me that I stood like a man at a mark the whole army shooting at me. She speaks with poignards, and every word stabs. If her breath were as terrible as her terminations, there would be no living near her. She would infect to the North Star. I would not bury her, though she were endowed with all that Adam bad had left before he transgressed. She would have made Hercules have turned spit, yea, and have cleft his club to make the fire, too. Come talk not of her. You shall find her the infernal eight in good apparel. I would to God some scholar would conjure her. For certainly while she is here, a man may live as quiet in hell as in any sanctuary. And people sin upon purpose because they would go thither, so indeed all this quiet horror and perturbation follows her. Look, here she comes. Oh, God, sir, here's a dish I love not. I can't endure my lady tongue. <laughs> we skipped something, didn't we? Oh, we did. We skipped, will your grace command me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> apologies. I'm back in there. <laughs> Look you. Sorry. Back up. My apologies. Will your grace command me any service to the world's end? I will go on the slightest errand now to the antipods that you could devise to send me on. I will fetch you a toothpicker now from the furthest inch of Asia. Bring you the length of Prester John's foot. Fetch you a hair of the great Shem's beard. Pupes any embassage to the pygmies rather than hold three words conference with this army. You have no employment for me? None, but to desire your good company. Oh, God, sir, there's a dish I'd love not. I cannot endure my lady tongue. Come, lady, come. You have lost the heart of Signor Benedict. Indeed, my lord. He lent it me a while, and I gave him use for it. 
a double heart for his single one. <clears throat> Mary, once before he wanted of me with false dice. Therefore, your grace may well say I have lost it. You have put him down, lady. You have put him down. So I would not he should do me, my lord, lest I should prove the mother of fools. I have brought Count Claudio, whom you sent me to seek. Why? How oh, now, Count? Wherefore you sad? Don't sad, my lord. Then how then? Sick? Neither, my lord. The Count is neither sad, nor sick, nor merry, nor well. But civil Count, civil as an orange, and something of that jealous complexion. Faith, lady, I think you're blazing to be true. Though I'll be sworn, if he be so, his conceit is false. Here, Claudio, I have wooed in thy name, and fair hero is won. I have broke with her father, and his good will obtained. Name the day of marriage, and God give thee joy. Count, take of me my daughter, and with her my fortunes. This grace hath made the match, and, and the grace say amen to it. Speak, Count, tis your cue. Silence is the perfectest herald of joy. I were but little happy if, if I could say how much, lady, as you are mine, I am yours. I give away myself for you and dote upon the exchange. Speak, cousin, or if you cannot, stop his mouth with a kiss and let him not speak either. Faith, lady, you have a merry heart. Yea, my lord, I thank it, poor fool. It keeps on the windy side of care. My cousin tells him in his ear that he is in her heart. And so she doth, cousin. Good Lord for alliance. Thus goes everyone to the world but I, and I am sunburnt. I may sit in a corner and cry, hi-ho for a husband. Lady Beatrice, I will get you one. I would rather have one of your father's getting. Hath your grace near a brother like you? Your father got excellent husbands if a maid could come by them. <sighs> Will you have me, lady? No, my lord. Unless I might have another for working days. Your grace is too costly to wear every day. But I beseech your grace, pardon me. I was born to speak all mirth and no matter. Your silence defends me, and to be married best becomes you. For the question you were born in a merry hour. No, sure, my lord. My mother cried. But then there was a star danced, and under that was I born. Cousins, God give you joy. Niece, will you look to those things I told you of? I cry your mercy, uncle, by your grace's pardon. By my troth, a pleasant spirited lady. There's little of the melancholy element in her, my lord. Uh, she is never sad but when she sleeps, and not even ever sad then. For I heard my daughter say she had often dreamed of unhappiness and wake herself with laughing. She cannot endure to hear tell of a husband. Oh, oh by no means. Uh, she mocks all her words out of suit. She <coughs> were an excellent wife for Benedict. Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> My Lord, if they were but a week married, they would talk themselves mad. County Claudio, when mean you to go to church? Tomorrow, my lord. Time goes on crutches till love of all its rights. Not till Monday, my dear son, which is hence just a seven night, and, and time too brief too to have all things answer my mind. Come, you shake the head at so long a breathing. But I warrant thee, Claudio, the time shall not go dully by us. I will in the interim undertake one of Hercules' labors, which is bring the Signor Benedict and the Lady Beatrice into a mountain of affection, the one with the other. I would fain have it a match, and I doubt not but to fashion it. If you three will administer such assistance as I shall give you direction. My lord, I am for you, uh, though it cost me ten nights watching. And I, my lord. And you too. Gentle hero. I will do any modest office, my lord, to help my cousin to a good husband. And Benedict is not the unhopefulest husband that I know. Thus far I, can I praise him. He is of a noble spirit, proved valor, firm honesty. I will teach you how to humor your cousin, 
that she shall fall in love with Benedict, and I, with your two helps, will so practice on Benedict that, in despite of his quick wit and his queasy stomach, he shall fall in love with Beatrice. If we can do this, Cupid is no longer an archer. Go in with me, and I will tell you my drift. It is so. The Count Claudio shall marry the daughter of Leonardo. Yea, my lord, but I can cross it. Any bar, any cross, any impediment will be medicinable to me. I am sick in displeasure to him, and whatsoever comes athwart his affection ranges evenly with mine. How canst thou cross this marriage? Not honestly, my lord, but so covertly that no dishonesty shall appear in me. Tell me briefly how. I think I told your lordship a year since how much I am in the favor of Margaret, the waiting gentlewoman to Hero. I remember. I can at any unseasonably instant of the night, I can at any unseasonable instant of the night appoint her to look out her lady's chamber window. What life is in that to be the death of this marriage? (laughs) The poison of that lies in you to temper. Go you to the prince, your brother. Spare not to tell him that he hath wronged his honor in marrying the renowned Claudio, whose estimation do you mightily hold up to a, contem- to a contaminated stale, such a one as hero. What proof shall I make of that? Proof enough to misuse the prince to vex Claudio, to undo Hero, and kill Leonardo. Look you for any other issue? Only to despite them, I will endeavor anything. <laughs> Go, then. Find me, find me a meet hour to draw Don Pedro and the Count Claudio alone. Tell them that you know that Hero loves me. Intend a kind of zeal both to the prince and Claudio, as in love of your brother's honor, who hath made his match, and his friend's reputation, who is thus like to be cozened with the semblance of a maid that you have discovered thus. They will scarcely believe this without trial. Offer them instances, which shall bear no less likelihood than to see me at her chamber window. Hear me call Margaret Hero. Hear Margaret term me Claudio and bring them to see the very night before the intended wedding. For in the meantime, I will so fashion the matter that Hero shall be absent, and there shall appear such seeming truth of Hero's disloyalty that jealousy shall be called assurance, and all the preparation overthrown. Throw this to what averse issue it can. I will put it in practice. Be cunning in the working of this, and thy fee is a thousand ducats. Be you constant in the accusation, and my cunning shall not shame me. I will presently go learn their day of marriage. Boy! Senor. In my chamber window lies a book. Bring it hither to me in the orchard. I am here already, sir. I know that. But I would have it be Pence in here again. I do much wonder that one man, seeing how much another man is a fool when he dedicates his behaviors to love, will, after he hath laughed at such shallow follies in others, become the argument of his own scorn by falling in love. Such a man is Claudio. I've known when there was no music with him but the drum and the pipe. Now, had he rather hear the table and the pipe? I've known when he would have walked ten miles afoot to see a good armor, now will he lie awake ten nights following the fashion of a new doublet, who is wont to speak plain and to the purpose, like an honest man and a soldier. Now is he turned orthography. His words are very fantastical banquet, just so many strange dishes. May I be so converted and see with these eyes? I cannot tell. I think not. 
I will not be sworn that love may transform me to an oyster. I'll take my oath on it. That he hath made an oyster of me, he shall never make me such a fool. One woman is fair, yet I am well. Another wise, yet I am well. Another virtuous, yet I am well. But until all graces be in one woman, one woman shall not come in my grace. Rich she shall be, that's for certain. Wise or I'll none, virtuous or I'll never cheapen her, fair or I'll never look on her, mild or come not near me, noble or not I for an angel, of good discourse, an excellent musician, and her hair shall be of whatever color it please God. <laughs> the Prince and Monsieur Love. I will hide me in the arbor. Um, shall we hear this music? Yea, my good lord, how still the evening is and hushed on purpose to grace harmony. See you where Benedict hath hid himself? Very well, my lord. <clears throat> the music ended. We'll fit the kid fox with a pennyworth. Come, Balthazar, we'll hear that song again. Oh, good my lord. Tax not so bad a voice to slander music at more than once. It is the witness still of excellency to put a strange face and his own perfection. I pray thee sing and let me woo no more. Because you talk of wooing, I will sing. Since many a wooer doth commence his suit to her, he thinks not worthy. Yet he woos, yet he, will he swear he loves. Now pray thee come, or if thou wilt hold longer argument, do it in notes. Note this before my notes. There's not a note of mine that's worth the noting. Why, these are very crotchets that he speaks. Notes, notes forsooth, and nothing. Now, divine heir, now is his soul ravished. Is it not strange that sheep's guts should hail souls out of men's bodies? Well, a horn for my money when all's done.
by my troth, a good song. And an ill singer, my lord. Ah, no, no, faith, thou singest well enough for a shift. Had she been a dog that should have howled thus, they would have hanged her. And I pray God her bad voice bode no mischief. I had as lief have heard the night raven come. What plague could have come after it? Yea, Mary, dost thou hear, Balthazar? I pray thee, get us some excellent music. For tomorrow night we would have it at the Lady Hero's bedroom chamber. The best I can, my lord. Do so. Farewell. Come hither, Leonardo. What was it you told me of today that your niece Beatrice was in love with Signor Benedict? Uh, uh, I stalk on, stalk on the foul sits. I did never think that lady would have loved any man. Nor, uh, no, nor I neither, but. Most wonderful that she should dote on Signor Benedict, whom she hath all outward behavior seen ever to abhor. Is possible since the wind in that corner? Uh, by my troth, my lord, I cannot tell what to think of it, but that she loves him with an enraged affection. It is past the infinite of thought. Maybe she doth a counterfeit. Hey, like enough. Oh God, a uh, counterfeit. Uh, there never was counterfeit of passion came so near the life of passion as she discovers it. Why, what effects of passion shows she? Bait the hook well, the fish will bite. Uh, 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 what effects, my lord? Uh, she will sit you, uh, you... Uh, you heard my daughter tell you how. She did indeed. How? How? Pray you. You amaze me. I, I would have thought that her spirit had been invincible against all the assaults of affection. I would have sworn it had, my lord, uh, especially against Benedict. I should think this a gull, but that the white-bearded fellow speaks it? Maybe he cannot, sure, hide it himself in such reverence. He has taken up the infection. Hold it up. <clears throat> Has she made her affection known to Benedict? No, and she swears she never will. Uh, that's her torment. <laughs> Tis true indeed, so your daughter says. Uh, shall I, says she, that so often countered him with scorn, write to him that I love him? This she says, she now, when she is beginning to write to him, uh, she'll be up for 20 times a night, and there she will sit in her smock till she have written a sheet of, sheet of paper. Uh, my daughter tells us all. <laughs> now, the talk of a sheet of paper, I remember a pretty gesture taught her told us of. <clears throat> oh, um, when she had writ it and she was reading it over, she found Benedict and Beatrice between the sheets. <laughs> that. Uh, she tore the letter into a thousand halfpence, uh, railed at herself that she should be so immodest to write to one uh, that she knew would flout her. I, I measure him, she, say, she says she, uh, but my own spirit, for I should flout him if he were to writ to me. Yeah, that I thought, I love him, I should. Then down upon her knees she falls, weeps, sobs, beats her heart, tears her hair, prays, curses. Oh, sweet Benedict, God, give me patience. Uh, she doth indeed, my daughter says so. And the ecstasy has so much overborne her that my daughter is sometimes afeard that she will do a desperate outrage to herself. It is very true. Mm, it were good that Benedict knew of it by some other, if she will not discover it. <laughs> to what end? He would make the sport of it and torment the poor lady worse. And he should. It were an alms to hang him. She's an excellent sweet lady, and out of all suspicion, she is virtuous. And she is exceeding wise. In everything but in loving Benedict. <laughs> oh, my lord, wisdom and blood come combating in so tender a body. 
We have ten proofs to one that blood hath the victory. I am sorry for her, as I have just caused, being her uncle and guardian. I would have, she had bestowed this dotage on me. I would have daffed all other respects and made her half myself. I pray you, tell Benedict of it and hear what I will say. Were it good, think you? Hero thinks surely she will die, for she says she will die, if he loves her not. And she will die. And makes her love her known, and she will die, if he woos her. Rather, she will bait one breath of her accustomed crossness. She doth well. If she should make tender of her love, tis very possible he'll scorn it. For the man, as you know all, hath a contemptible spirit. <laughs> He's a very proud man. He hath indeed a good outward happiness. Before God, and in my mind, very wise. He doth indeed show some sparks that are like wit. And I take him to be valiant. As Hector, I assure you. And in the managing of quarrels, it may say he is wise, for either he avoids them with great discretion or undertakes them with the most Christian-like fear. If he do fear God, I must necessarily keep the peace if he... Break the peace, he ought to enter into a quarrel with fear and trembling. And so will he do, for the man doth fear God. However, it seems not in him by some large jests he will make. Well, I am sorry for your niece. Shall we go seek Benedict and tell him of her love? <laughs> Never tell him, my lord. Let her wear it out with good counsel. Nay, that's impossible. She may wear her heart out first. Well... We will hear further of it by your daughter. Let it cool a while. I love Benedict well, and I could wish he would modestly examine himself to see how much he is unworthy. So good a lady. My lord, will you walk? Dinner is ready. If he do not dote on her upon this, I will never trust my expectation. Let there be the same net spread for her. And that must your daughter and her grand gentlewoman carry. The sport will be when they hold one an opinion of another's dotage and no such matter. That's the scene that I would see, which will merely a dumb show. Let us send her to call him to dinner. This can be no trick. The conference was sadly born. They have the truth of this from Hero. They seem to pity the lady. It seems her affections have their full bent. Love me? Why, it must be requited. I hear how I am censured. They say I will bear myself proudly if I perceive the love come from her. They say, too, that she would rather die than give me any sign of affection. Ah. <sighs> I did never think to marry. I must not seem proud. Happy are they that hear their detractions and can put them to mending. They say the lady is fair. Tis the truth, I can bear the witness. And virtuous, tis so. I cannot reprove it. And wise, but for loving me. By my troth, it is no addition to her wit, nor no great argument of her folly, for I will be horribly in love with her. I may chance have some odd quirks and remnants of wit broken on me because I have railed so long against marriage, but doth not the appetite alter? A man loved the meat in his youth that he cannot endure in his age. Shall quips and sentences and these paper bullets of the brain are a man from the career of his humor? No. The world must be peopled. When I said I would die a bachelor, I did not think I should live until I were married. Oh, here comes Beatrice. By this day, she is a fair lady. Ooh, I despise some marks of love in her. Against my will, I am sent to bid you come into dinner. 
Fair Beatrice, I thank you for your pains. I took no more, no more pains for those thanks than you take pains to thank me. If it had been painful, I would not have come. You take pleasure in the message then? Yea, just so much as you may take upon a knife's point and choke a doll withal. You have no stomach, senor. Fare you well. <laughs> Against my will, I am sent to bid you come in to dinner. And there's a double meaning in that. I took no more pains for those thanks than you took pains to thank me. That's as much to say, any pains that I take for you is as easy as thanks. If I do not take pity of her, I'm a villain. If I do not love her, I am a Jew. I will go get her picture. <laughs> Good Margaret, run thee to the parlor. There shalt thou find my cousin Beatrice, proposing with the prince and Claudio. Whisper in her ear and tell her I and Ursula walk in the orchard, and our whole discourse is all of her. Say that thou overheard us, and bid us steal her into the pleached bower, where honeysuckles ripened by the sun. Forbid the sun to enter like favorites, made proud by princes that advance their pride against that power that bred it. There will she hide her, to listen our purpose, this is thy office. Bear thee well in it, and leave us alone. I'll make her come. I warrant you presently. Now, Ursula, when Beatrice doth come, as we do trace this alley up and down, our talk must only be of Benedict. When I do name him, let it be thy part to praise him more than ever man did merit. My talk to thee must be how Benedict is sick in love with Beatrice. Of this matter is little Cupid's crafty arrow made, that only wounds by hearsay. Now begin, for look where Beatrice, like a lapwing, runs close by the ground to hear our conference. The pleasantest angling is to see the fish cut with golden oars the silver stream and greedily devour the treacherous bait. So angle we for Beatrice, who even now is couched in the woodman coverture. Fear you not my part of the dialogue. Then go we near her, that her ear lose nothing of the false sweet bait that we lay for it. No, truly, Ursula, she is too disdainful. I know her spirits are as coy and wild as haggards of the rock. But are you sure that Benedict loves Beatrice so entirely? So says the prince and my new trothed lord. And did they bid you tell her of it, madam? They did entreat me to acquaint her of it. But I persuaded them, if they loved Benedict, to wish him wrestle with affection and never to let Beatrice know of it. Why did you so? Doth not the gentleman deserve as full of fortunate a bed as ever Beatrice shall couch upon? Oh, God of love, I know he doth deserve as much as may be yielded to a man. But nature never framed a woman's heart of prouder stuff than that of Beatrice. Disdain and scorn ride sparkling in her eyes, misprising what they look on, and her wit values itself so highly that to her all matter else seems weak. She cannot love, nor take no shape, nor project of affection. She is so self-endured. Sure, I think so. And therefore, certainly, it were not good she knew his love, lest she make sport at it. Why, you speak truth. I never yet saw man how wise, how noble, young, how rarely featured. But she would spell him backward. If fair face, she would swear the gentleman should be her sister. If black, why, nature drawing of an antique, made a foul blot. If tall, a lance ill-headed. If low, an agate very vilely caught. If speaking, why, a vein blown with all winds. If silent, why, a block moved with none. So turns she every man the wrong side out, and never gives to truth and virtue that which simpleness and merit purchase. Sure, sure, such carping is not commendable. No, not to be so odd and from all fashions as Beatrice is, cannot be commendable. But who dare tell her so? If I should speak, she would mock me into air, or she would laugh me out of myself, press me to death with wit. Therefore let Benedict, like covered fire, consume away in size, waste inwardly. It were a better death than die with mocks, which is as bad as die with tickling. 
Yet tell her of it. Hear what she will say. No, rather I will go to Benedict and counsel him to fight against his passion. And truly I'll devise some honest slanders to slain my cousin with. One doth not know how much an ill word may empoison liking. Oh, do not do your cousin such a wrong. She cannot be so much without true judgment, having so swift and excellent a wit, and she is prized to have, as to refuse so rare a gentleman as Signor Benedict. He is the only man of Italy, always excepted my dear Claudio. I pray you, be not angry with me, madam, speaking my fancy. Signor Benedict, for shape, for bearing, argument, and valor, goes foremost in report through Italy. Indeed, he hath an excellent good name. His excellence did earn it, ere he had it. When are you married, madam? Why, every day, tomorrow. Come, go in, I'll show thee some attires, and have thy counsel, which is the best to fur furnish me tomorrow. She's limed, I warrant you. We have caught her, madam. If it proves so, then loving goes by haps. Some Cupid kills with arrows, some with traps. What fire is in mine ears? Can this be true? Should stand I condemned for pride and scorn so much? Contempt, farewell. Made in pride, adieu. No glory lives behind the back of such. Benedict, love on. I will requite thee, taming my wild heart to thy loving hand. If thou dost love, my kindness shall incite thee to bind our loves up in a holy band. For others say thou dost deserve it. And I believe it better than reportingly. I do but stay till your marriage be consummate, and then go I toward Aragon. Bring you thither, my lord, if you'll vouchsafe me. Nay, there will be as great a soil in the new gloss of your merits as to show a child his new coat and forbid him to wear it. They will only be bold with Benedict for his company, for from the crown of his head to the sole of his foot he is all mirth. He hath twice or thrice cut Cupid's bowstring, and the little hangman dare not shoot at him. He hath a heart as sound as a bell, and his tongue is the clapper. For what his heart thinks, his tongue speaks. Gallant, I am not as I had been. So say I may think you are sad. I hope you be in love. Hang him, truant. There's no two drop of blood in him to be truly touched with love. If he be sad, he wants money. I have a toothache. Draw it. Hang it. You must hang it first, then draw it afterwards. What? Sigh for the toothache? <laughs> Where is but a humor or a worm? Well, everyone can master grief, but he that has it. Yet say I. <laughs> he is in love. There is no appearance of fancy in him, unless it be a fancy that he hath to strange disguises as to be a Dutchman today, a Frenchman tomorrow, in the shape of two countries at once, as a German from the waist downward, all slops, and a Spaniard from the hip upward, no doublet, unless he have a fancy to this foolery, as it appears he hath. He is no fool for fancy, as you would have it, it appears he is. If he be not in love with some woman, there is no believing the old signs. A brush in his hat of the mornings. What should that bode? Has any man seen him at the barber's? No, but the barber's man hath been seen with him, and the old ornament of his cheek hath already stuffed tennis balls. <laughs> Indeed, he looks younger than he did uh, by the loss of the beard. Nay, a rubs himself with civet. Can you smell him up by that? That's as much to say, <laughs> the sweet youth's in love. The great is his melancholy. <laughs> and, when he, and when was he wont to wash his face? Yea, or to paint himself. For the Which Nay. I hear what they say of him. <laughs> Nay, but his jesting spirit, 
which is now crept into the lute string and now governed by stops. Indeed. That tells a heavy tale for him. Conclude he is in love. <laughs> Nay, but I know who loves him. That would I know too. I warrant one that knows him not. <laughs> yes, and his ill conditions, and in despite of all, dies for him. He has this no charm for the two fake. Old senior, walk beside with me. I have studied eight or nine wise words to speak to you, which these hobby horses must not hear. Hmm. And looks like Mark's back. Okay, he's back. Can we... Mark, you there? Ow. You want me to, you want me to do the last line? Is that someone's fire? Oh, sorry. Uh, oh my god, my dog's probably about to bark at that fire alarm. Hold on. Yeah. Hold that on. would be saying, you want to just continue after it or? Uh, uh, I'll say it. Okay. For my life. For my life to break with him about Beatrice. If so, here and Margaret have by this their parts and with Beatrice, and the two bears will not bite one another when they meet. My lord and brother, God save you. Good and brother. If your leisure served, I would speak with you. In private. If it please you, yet Count Claudio may hear for what I would speak of concerns him. What's the matter? Means your lordship to be married tomorrow. You know he does. I know not that when he knows what I know. If there be any impediment, I pray you, discover it. You may think I love you not. Let that appear hereafter and aim better at me by that which I now will manifest. For my brother, I think he holds you well, and in dearness of heart hath hoped to effect this ensuing marriage. Surely, suit ill spent and labor ill bestowed. Why, what's the matter? I came hither to tell you, and circumstances shorten, for she's been too long a talking of, the lady is disloyal. Who? Hero. Even she. Leonardo's hero, your hero, every man, hero. Disloyal. The word is too good to paint out her wickedness. I could say she were worse. Thank you of a worse title, and I can fit her to it. Wonder not till further warrant. Go but with me tonight. You shall see her chamber window entered, even the night before her wedding day. If you love her then, tomorrow wed her. But it would better fit your honor to change your mind. May this be so? I will not think it. If you dare not trust that you say confess, not that you know. If you will follow me, I will show you enough. And when you have seen more and heard more, proceed accordingly. If I see anything tonight, why should I not marry her tomorrow? And in the congregation <clears throat> where I should wed, then I will shame her. And as I would for thee to obtain her, I will join with thee to disgrace her. I will disparage her no farther till you are my witnesses. Bear it coldly, but till midnight, and let the issue show itself. How day untowardly turned. Mischief strangely thwarting. Oh, plague right well prevented. So will you say when you have seen the sequel? Oh. Are you good men and true? Yea, or else it were pity that they should suffer salvation, body, and soul. <laughs> Nay, that were a punishment too good for them if they should have any allegiance in them, being chosen for the prince's watch. Mm -hmm. Well, give them their charge, neighbor Dogberry. First, who think you the most desertless man to be constable? Do the auditank, sir, or George C. Cole, for they can write and read. 
<laughs> Come hither, neighbor Seiko. God has blessed you with a good name. To be a well-favored man is the gift of fortune, but to write and read comes by nature. Both which, Master Constable? You have. I knew it would be your answer. Well, your favor, sir, why give God thanks and make no boast of it. And for your writing and reading, let that appear when there is no need of such vanity. You are thought to be here, to be most senseless and fit man of the constable of the watch. Therefore, bear you the lantern. This is your charge. You shall comprehend all Vagram men. You are to bid any man stand in the prince's name. How if I will not stand? Why, then take no note of him, but let him go and presently call the rest of the watch together. And thank God you are rid of a knave. He will not stand when he's bidden, then he's none of the prince's subjects. <laughs> true, true. And you are to meddle with none but the prince's subjects. You shall also make no noise in the streets, for, uh, for the watch to babble and to talk is uh, most tolerable and not to be endured. We will rather sleep than talk. We know what belongs to a watch. Why, you speak like an ancient and most quiet watchman. For I cannot see how sleeping should offend. Only have a care that your bills be not stolen. Well, you are to call at all the alehouses and bid those that are drunk to get them to bed. How if they will not? Why, then let them alone till they are sober. <laughs> if they make you not then the better answer, you may say they are not the men you took them for. Well, sir. If you mate a thief, you may suspect him by virtue of your office to be no true man. And for such kind of men, the less you meddle or make with them, why the more is for your honesty. If we know him to be a thief, shall we not lay hands on him? Truly, by your office, you may, but I think that they that touch pitch will be defiled. The most peaceable way for you, if you do take a thief, is to let him show himself what he is and steal out of your company. You have always been called a merciful man, partner. Truly, I would not hang a dog by my will, much more a man who hath any honesty in him. If you hear a child cry in the night, you must call to the nurse and bid her still it. How if the nurse be asleep and will not hear us? Why then depart in peace and let the child wake her with crying. For the you that will not hear her lamb when it bays will never enter a calf when it bleats. It is very true. <laughs> this is the end of your charge. You Constable, are to are present pre <laughs> the prince's own person. If you meet the prince in the night, you may stay him. My, by your lady, I think he cannot. Five shillings to, the <laughs> uh, to one aunt. With any man that knows the statutes, he may stay him. Mary, not without the prince be willing, for indeed the watch ought to offend no man. And mm -hmm. if it is the offense to stay a man against his will. By our lady, I think it'd be so. <laughs> <laughs> well, masters, good night. And there be any matter of weight chances, call up me. Keep your fellow's counsel and your own, and good night come, neighbor. Well, masters, we hear our charge. Let us go sit here upon the church bench till two and then all to bed. One more word, honest neighbors. I pray you watch about Signor Leonato's door for the wedding being there tomorrow. There is a great coil tonight. Mm -hmm. Do be vigilant, I beseech you. The screen went white. Uh-oh, we have an, uh, let's see, Baraccio? 
We have some technical difficulties. Hold on. Okay. I'm getting back. So if you want to just keep going, we can hear you. If you want to just do some audio until you can get the video back up. Yeah, let's just uh, let's just keep going. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> what, Conrad? Peace, stir not. Conrad, I say. Here, man, here, I'm at thy elbow. Mass, and my elbow itched. <laughs> I thought there would be a scab follow. I will owe thee an answer for that, and now forward with thy tape. Stand thee close, then, under this penthouse, for it drizzles rain, and I will, like a true drunkard, utter all to thee. Some treasons, master, yet stand close. Therefore know I have earned of Don John a thousand ducats. Is it possible that any villainy should be so dear? Thou shouldst rather ask if I were... Possible any villainy should be so rich. For when rich villains have need of poor ones, poor ones make what price they will. Hmm. I wonder at it. That shows thou art unconfirmed. Thou knowest that the fashion of a doublet, or a hat, or cloak, is nothing to a man. Hmm. Yes, it is apparel. I mean, hmm. the fashion. Yes, yes, the fashion is the fashion. Tush! I may as well say the fool's the fool. But seest thou not what a deformed thief this fashion is? I know that deformed. I has been, been a vile thief this seventy year. Air goes up, down like a gentleman. I remember his name. Didst thou not hear somebody? No, twas the vein on the house. Seest thou not, I say, what a doomed, deformed thief this fashion is. How giddily it turns about all the hot bloods between fourteen and five and thirty. Sometimes fashioning them like a pharaoh's soldiers in the reeky painting. Sometimes like Godbell's priests in the old church window. Sometime like the shaven Hercules in the smirched worm-eaten tapestry, where his codpiece seems as a massy as his club. <laughs> All this I see, and I see that the fashion wears out most apparel than the man. But art thou not thyself giddy with the fashion too, that thou hast shifted out of thy tale into telling me of the fashion? Not so, neither. But know that I have tonight wooed Margaret, the Lady Hero's gentlewoman, by the name of Hero. She leans me out to her at her mistress's chamber window, bids me a thousand times good night. I tell this tale vilely. <clears throat> I should first tell thee how the prince Claudio and my master planted and placed and possessed by my master Don John, saw afar off in the orchard this amiable encounter. <laughs> and thought they Margaret was hero? Yeah, two of them did, the prince and Claudio. But the devil my master knew, she was Margaret, and partly by his oaths, which per first possessed them, <clears throat> And partly, um, partly by the dark of night, which did deceive them, but chiefly by my villainy, which did confirm any slander that Don John had made, away went Claudio enraged, swore he would meet her as he was appointed next morning at the temple, and there, before the whole congregation, shame her with what he saw overnight and send her home again without a husband. <laughs> we charge you in the name of the prince's name, stand. 
call up the right master constable. We have here recovered the most dangerous piece of lechery that ever was known in the Commonwealth. And one deformed is one of them. I know him, aware is a lock. Masters, masters. You'll be made bring deformed forth, I warned you. Masters, please. Never speak. We charge you. Let us obey you to go with us. You like to prove a goodly commodity being taken up these men's bills. But a commodity in question, I warrant you. Come, come, we'll obey you, right? Right? Right, right. Good Ursula, wake my cousin Beatrice and desire her to rise. I will, lady. And bid her come hither. Well. No, I think your other rabato were better. No, pray thee, good Meg. I'll wear this. By my talk, not so good, and I warrant your cousin will say so. My cousin's a fool, and thou art another. I'll wear none but this. I like the new tire with an excellently. If the hair were a thought browner, and your gowns a most rare fashion, I say, I saw the Duchess of Milan's gown that they praised so. Oh, uh, that exceeds, they say. <laughs> By my troth, but not a nightgown in respect of yours. Cloth of gold and cuts and laced with silver, set with pearls, down sleeves, oh, side sleeves and skirt, oh, round, underborn with bluish tinsel, but for a fine, quaint, graceful, and excellent fashion, yours is worth ten on. God, give me joy to wear it, for my heart is exceeding heavy. <laughs> Twill be heavier soon by the weight of a man. Fie upon thee, art not shamed? <laughs> of what, lady? Of speaking honorably. Is not marriage honorable in a beggar? Is not your lord honorable without marriage? I think you would have me say, saving your reverence, a husband, and bad thinking, do not rest truth speaking. I'll offend nobody. Is there any harm in the heavier for a husband? None, I think. And it would be the right husband and the right wife. Otherwise, tis light and not heavy. Oh, ask my lady Beatrice. Oh, here she comes. Good morrow, cuz. Good morrow, sweet hero. Why, how now? Do you speak in the sick tune? I am out of all other tune, methinks. Oh, clasped into lighter love. That goes without a burden. Do you sing it? Now dance it. Ye light a love with your heels. Then if your husband have stables enough, you'll see he shall lack no, ba no barns. <laughs> Illegitimate construction. I scorn that with my heels. Tis almost five o'clock, cousin. Tis time you were ready. By my trope, I am exceeding ill. Hi-ho! <laughs> For a hawk, a horse, a husband? But a letter that begins with them all. <laughs> well, and you be not turned Turk, there's no more sailing by the star. What means the fool, Trow? Oh, nothing I. Oh, but God send every one of their hearts desire. These gloves the Count sent me, they are an excellent perfume. I am stuffed, cousin. I cannot smell. A maid! I'm stuffed! Oh, you're goodly catching of cold. God help me. How long have you professed apprehension? Ever since you left it, doth not my wit become me rarely. It is not seen enough. You should wear it in your cap. By my troth, I am sick. Oh, get you some of this distilled hardest Benedictus, and lay it your heart, it is the only thing for a qualm. There thou prickest her with a thistle. Benedictus? Why Benedictus? You have some moral in this Benedictus. Moral? No, by my troth, I have no moral meaning. I meant plain, holy thistle. You may think for chance that I think that you are in love, nay. By your lady, I am not such a fool to think while what I list, nor I list not to think what I can, nor indeed I cannot think. If I would think my heart out of thinking that you are in love or that you will be in love or that you can be in love, 
Yet, Benedict was such another, and now is he become a man? He swore he would never marry, and yet now, in despite of his heart, he eats his meat without grudging. And how you may be converted, I know not, but methinks you look with your eyes as other women do. What pace is it that thy tongue keeps? <laughs> not a false gallop. Madam, withdraw the prince, the count, Signor Benedict, Don John, and all the gallants of the town are come to fetch you to church. A help to dress me, good cuz, good Meg, good Ursula. What would you with me, honest neighbor? Mary, sir, I would have some confidence with you that discerns you nearly. Uh, brief. I pray you, for you see it is a busy time with me. Mary, this is it, sir. Ah, oh, yes, in truth it is, sir. Uh, what is it, good friend? Goodman Virgis, sir, speaks a little off the matter. An old man, sir, and his wits are... Not so blunt, as God help, I would desire they were. But in faith, honest as the skin between his brows. Yes, <laughs> I thank God I am an honest as any man living. That is an old man and no honester than I. <laughs> Comparisons are odorous. Palabras, neighbor virtus. Neighbors, you are tedious. <laughs> It pleases me, your worship, to say so. But we are poor Duke's officers. But truly, for mine own part, if I were as tedious as a king, I could find it in my heart to bestow it all on your worship. All by tediousness on me. Uh. Yea, and twere a thousand pound more than tis. For I hear as good exclamation on your worship as any man in the city, and though I be but a poor man, I am glad to hear it. And so am I. I would fain know what you have to say. Mary, sir, I watch tonight, except in your worship's presence, hath, hath ta'en a couple of as errant knaves as any in Messina. A good old man, sir, he will be talking, as they say, when the age is in, the wit is out. God help us. It is a world to say. Well said, in faith, neighbor Virgis. Well, God's a good man, and two men ride a horse, one must ride behind. An honest soul is faith, sir. By my troth he is, as ever broke bread, but God is to be worshipped. All men are not alike. Alas, good neighbor. Indeed, neighbor, he comes too short of you. <laughs> Gift that God gives. I must leave you. One word, sir. Our watch, sir, have indeed comprehended two aspicious persons, and we would have them this morning examined before your worship. Take their examination for yourself and bring it to me. I am now in great haste, as it may appear unto you. It shall be suffragants. But drink some wine ere you go. Uh, fare you well. My lord, they stay for you to give your daughter to her husband. I'll wait upon them. I am ready. Go, good partners. Go get you to Francis Siegel. Bid him bring his pen and inkhorn to the gal. We are now to examination these men. And we must do it wisely. We will spare for no wit, I warrant you. Here's what shall drive some of them to noncom. Only get the learned writers to set down our excommunication and meet at the gal. Come, Friar Francis, uh, be brief only to the plain form of marriage, and you shall recount their particular duties afterward. You come hither, my lord, to marry this lady. Uh, to be married to her, uh, 
Friar, you come to marry her. Lady, you come hither to be married to this count. I do. If either of you know any inward impediment why you should not be conjoined, charge you upon your souls to utter it. Are you any hero? None, my lord. Know you of any count? I dare make his answer, uh, none. Oh, when, when dare do? What men may do? What men daily do, not knowing what they do? Now, now, interjections, why then some be of laughing as a uh, ha he? Stand thee by, friar, father, by your leave. Will you with free and unconstrained soul give me this maid, your daughter? As freely son as God give her to me. And what have I to give you back, whose worth may counterpoise this rich and precious gift? Nothing, unless you render her again. Sweet prince, you learn me noble thankfulness. There, Leonardo, take her back again. Give not this rotten orange to your friend. She's but the sign and semblance of her honor. Behold, how like a maid she blushes here. Oh, what authority and show of truth can cunning sin cover itself with all? Comes not that blood as modest evidence to witness simple virtue? Would you not swear? Oh, you that see her here, that she were amazed by these exterior shows. But she is none. She's known the heat of a luxurious bed. Her blush is guiltiness, not modesty. What do you mean, my lord? Not to be married. Not to knit my soul to an unapproved, to an approved wanton. Dear my lord, if you, in your own proof, have vanquished the resistance of her youth and made defeat of her virginity. I know what you would say. That I have known her. You would say she did embrace me as a husband and so extenuate the forehand sin. No, Leonardo, I never tempted her with word too large, but as a brother to his sister showed bashful sincerity and comely love. And seemed I ever otherwise to you. Out on the seeming. All right against it. You seem to me as dying in a robe, as chaste as in the bud ere it be blown. But you are more intemperate in your blood than Venus or those pampered animals that rage in savage sensibility. My lord, well, that he doth speak so wide. Sweet prince, why speak not you? What should I speak? I stand dishonored, that I've gone about to link my dear friend to a common stale. Are all these things spoken, or do I but dream? Sir, they are spoken, and these things are true. This looks not like a nuptial. True! Oh, God! Leonardo, stand I here. Is this the prince? Is this the prince's brother? Is this the fa is this face heroes? Are our eyes our own? All this is so, but what of this, my lord? Let me but move one question to your daughter, and... By that fatherly, our kindly power that you have in her, bid her answer truly. I charge thee, do so, as thou art my child. God, defend me. How am I beset? What kind of catches call you this? To make you answer truly to your name. Is it not Hero, who can blot that name with any just reproach? Mary, that can Hero. Hero itself can blot out hero's virtue. What man was he talked with you yesterday night out your window between twelve and one? Now, if you are a maid, answer to this. I talked with no man at that hour, my lord. Why, then, you are no maiden. Leonardo, I am sorry you must hear. 
on my honor, myself, my brother, and this Greek count did see her at that hour last night talk with a ruffian at the window who hath indeed, most like a liberal villain, confessed the vile encounters they have had a thousand times secret. Aye, if I there not be named, my lord, not to be spoke of, there is not chastity enough in language without offense to utter them. Thus, pretty lady, I am sorry for thy much misgovernment. Oh, hero, what a hero hast thou been! If half thy outward graces had been placed about thy thoughts and counsels of thy heart, fare thee well, most foul, most fair. Farewell, thou pure impiety and impi impious purity. For thee I'll lock up all the gates of love, and on my eyelids I'll conjecture hang to turn all beauty into thoughts of harm, and never shall it be more gracious. Has no man's dagger here a point for me? Mm. Why, how now, cousin? Wherefore sink you down? Come, let us go. These things come thus to light, smother her spirits out. How doth the lady? Dead, I think. Help, uncle. Hero, why hero? Uncle, Senor Benedict, friar. Oh, faith, take not away the heavy hand. Death is the fairest cover for her shame that may be wished for. How now, cousin hero? Have comfort, lady. Dost thou look up? Yea, wherefore should she not? Wherefore? Why doth every earthly thing cry shame upon her? Could she here deny the story that is printed in her blood? Do not live, hero, do not ope thine eyes. For did I think thou wouldst not quickly die? Though I by the spirits were stronger than thy shames, my silk would on the weird wood of reproaches strike a delight. Grieved I had I but one child I for that frugal nature's frame. Oh, one too much by thee. Why had I one? Why ever wast thou lovely in my eyes? Why not I had not with charitable hands took up a beggar's issue at my gates, uh, who smirched thus admired within of me? I might have said, no part of this is mine. This shame derives itself from unknown loins. But mine, and mine I loved, and mine I praised, and mine I was proud on, mine so much that I myself, mine, <clears throat> valuing of her, while she has fallen into a pink of it that the wide sea hath dropped, too few to wash her clean again. And salt too little which may season give her to her foul tainted flesh. Sir, sir, be patient. For my part, I am so tired in wonder, I know not what to say. Oh, on my soul, my cousin is belied. Lady, were you her bedfellow last night? No, truly not. Although until last night, I have this twelve month been her bedfellow. Confirmed! Confirmed! Oh, that is stronger maid, which was before barred up with ribs of iron? Would the two princes lie, and Claudio lie, who loved her so that, speaking of her foulness, washed it with tears, and somehow let her die? Hear me a little, for I have only been silent so long and given way unto this course of fortune. By noting of the lady, I have marked a thousand blushing apparitions to start into her face, a thousand innocent shames in angel whiteness beat away those blushes, and in her eye there hath appeared a fire to burn the errors that these princes hold against her maiden truth. Call me a fool, trust not my reading nor my observations, with, which with experimental seal doth warrant the tenor of my book. Trust not my age, my reverence, calling, nor divinity, if this sweet lady lie not guiltless here, under some biting error. Friar, it cannot be. Thou seest that all the grace that she has left is that she will not add to her damnation a sin of perjury. She not denies it. Why seekest 
than to cover with excuse which appears in proper nakedness. Lady, what man is he you are accused of? They know that do accuse me. I know none. If I know more of any man alive than that which made in modesty doth warrant, let all my sins lack mercy. O oh, my father, prove you that any man with me conversed at hours on meat, or that I yesternight maintained the change of words with any creature. Refuse me, hate me, torture me to death. There is some strange misprision in the princes. The two of them have the very bent of honor, and if their wisdoms be misled in this, the practice of it lies in John the Bastard, whose spirits toil and fame with villainies. I know not. If they speak but truth of her, these hands shall tear her. If they wrong her honor, the proudest of them shall well hear of it. Time hath not yet so dried this blood of mine, nor age eaten up my invention, nor fortune made such havoc of my means, nor my bad life reft me so much of friends, but they shall find Awaken in such a kind, both the strength of limb and policy of mind, ability in the means and choice of friends, to quit me thoroughly of them. Pause a while, and let my counsel sway you in this case. Your daughter here the prince is left for dead. Let her a while be secretly kept in, and publish it that she is dead indeed. Maintain a mourning ostentation, and on your family's old monument hang mournful epitaphs and do all the rites that appertain unto a burial. What shall become of this? What will this do? Mary, this well carried shall on her behalf change slander to remorse. That is some good, but not for that dream I on this strange course, but on this travail look for greater birth. She dying, as it must so be maintained, upon the instant that she was accused shall be lamented pitied and excused of every hearer, for it so falls out that what we have, we prize not the worth whilst we enjoy it, but being lacked and lost, why then we rack the value? Then we find the virtue that possession would not show us. The virtue that, oh, excuse me, well, well, it was ours. So it will fare with Claudio, when he shall hear she died upon his words, the idea of her life shall sweetly creep into his study of imagination, and every organ of her life shall become apparelled in more precious habit, more moving, delicate, and full of life into the eye and prospect of his soul than when she lived indeed. Then shall he mourn if ever love had interest in his liver and wish he had not so accused her, no, though he thought his accusation true. Let this be so, and doubt not but success will fashion the event in better shape than I can lay it down in likelihood. But if all aim but this be leveled false, the supposition of this lady's death will quench the wonder of her infamy. And if not, and if, fuck. and if it sort not well, you may conceal her as best befits her wronged reputation in some reclusive and religious life, out of all eyes, tongues, minds, and injuries. Signor Leonardo, let the friar advise you. And though you know my inwardness and love is very much unto the prince and Claudio, yet by mine honor I will deal in this as secretly and justly as your soul should with your body. Being that I flow with grief, the smallest twine may lead me. Tis well consented, presently anyway, for to strange sores strangely they strain the cure. Come, lady, die to live. This wedding day perhaps is but prolonged. Have patience and endure. Lady Beatrice, have you wept all this while? Whoops, okay. <clears throat> Yay, and I will weep a while longer. I will not desire that. You have no reason. I do it freely. Surely I do believe your fair cousin is wronged. <sighs> How much might the man deserve of me that would write her? Is there any way to show such friendship? 
a very even way for no such friend. May a man do it. It is a man's office, but not yours. I do love nothing in the world so well as you. Is not that strange? As strange as, as the thing I know not. It were as possible for me to say, I love nothing so well as you, but believe me not. And yet I lie not. I confess nothing, nor I deny nothing. I am sorry for my cousin. By my sword, Beatrice, thou lovest me. Do not swear and eat it. I will swear by it that you love me, and I will make him eat it that says I love not you. Will you not eat your word? With no sauce that can be devised to it, I protest, I love thee. Why then, God forgive me. What offense, sweet Beatrice? You have stayed me in a happy hour. I was about to protest I loved you. And do it with all thy heart. I love you with so much of my heart that none is left to protest. Come, bid me do anything for thee. Kill Claudio. <laughs> Not for the wide world. You kill me to deny it. Farewell. Terry, sweet Beatrice. I am gone, though I am here. There is no love in you. Nay, I pray you, let me go. Hey, Beatrice. In faith, I will go. We will be friends first. You dare easier be friends with me than fight with mine enemy. Is Claudio that enemy? Is he not approved in the height of villain that hath slandered, scorned, dishonored my kinswoman? Oh, that I were a man. What, bear her in hand until they come to take hands? And then with public accusation, uncovered slander, unmitigated rancor. Oh, God, that I were a man. I would eat his heart in the marketplace. Hear me, Beatrice. How put the man out of the window? Proper saying. Nay, but Beatrice. She hero, she is wronged. She is slandered. She Beatrice. is undone. Princes and counties. Surely a princely testimony, a goodly count, count comfect, a sweet gallant. Surely, oh, that I were a man for his sake. Or that I had any friend would be a man for my sake. But manhood has melted into courtesies, valor into compliment, and men are only turned into tongue and trim ones too. He is now as valiant as Hercules that only tells a lie and swears it. I cannot be a man with wishing. Therefore I will die a woman with grieving. Terry, Beatrice, by this hand, I love thee. Use it for my love some other way than swearing by it. Think you and your soul that Count Claudio hath wronged here. Yea, as sure as I have a thought or soul. Enough. I am engaged. I will challenge you. I will kiss your hand, and so I leave you. By this hand, Claudio shall render me your account. As you hear of me, so think of me. Go, comfort your cousin. I must say she is dead. And so, farewell. Blackout. You guys good if we take 10? Yeah, that's fine. All right, cool. Next, now I have time to get away from the fact that I'm sad I about that No, I know, it's insane. I love that scene. It's so sad and so infuriating. <laughs> I know, Steven, I know. <laughs> Nobody knows the trouble I see. Oh, it's so upsetting. And, yeah. and I, this cast, like, I think with a certain group, other group of people, it could have been like, Meh, but y'all are awesome. So I don't mind crying on camera, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> What's up? Is our old assembly appeared? Oh, a uh, stool and a cushion for the sexton. Be the malefactors. Mary, that am I and my partner. Mm. Hey, that's certain. 
we have the exhibition to examine. <clears throat> but which are the offenders that are to be examined? Let oh. them come before Master Constable. Yes, Mary, let them come before me. What is your name, friend? Baraccio. Pray, write that down, Baraccio. Yours, Sarah. I am a gentleman, sir, and my name is Conrad. <clears throat> write down, Master Gentleman Conrad. Thank you. Masters, do you serve, Dodd? Yes, sir, we hope, we hope. Mm. Yes, sir, we hope. Write down that they hope they serve God, and write God first, for God defend, but God should go before such villains. Mm -hmm. Masters, is it proved already that you are little better than false names? And it will go near to be thought so shortly. How answer you for yourselves? Mary, sir, we say we are none. None, um, yes, none. A marvelous, oh. witty fellow, I assure you. But I will go about with him. Come you hither, sirrah. A word in your ear. <clears throat> I say to you, it is thought you are false names. Sir, I say to you, we are none. But stand aside, for God, they are both in a tale. Have you written down that they are none? Uh, Master Constable, you go not the way to examine. You must call forth the watch that are, are their accusers. Hmm. Yay, Mary, that's the eftest way. Let the watch come forth. Masters, mm -hmm. I charge you. On your soul. In the prince's name, accuse these men. This man said, sir, that Don John, the prince's brother, was a villain. Write down Prince John a villain. Mm. Why, this is flat perjury to call the prince's brother villain. Master Constable. Pray thee, fellow peace. Mm. I do not like thy look. I promise thee. Oh. Um. Oh, what heard you him say else? Mary, that he had received a thousand ducats of Don John for accusing the lady here wrongfully. That burglary that ever was committed. Yea, by mass that it is. What else, fellow? And that Count Claudio did mean upon his words to disgrace Hero before the whole assembly and not marry her. Oh, villain! Thou wilt be condemned into everlasting redemption <laughs> <What> this. <laughs> this is all. And this is more, masters, than you can deny. Prince John is this morning secretly stolen away. Mm -hmm. Hero was in this manner accused, in this very manner refused, and upon the grief of the sudden died, Master Constable. Let these men be bound and brought to Leonato's. I will go before and show him their exhilaration. Adios. Come, let them be opinioned. Let, it, let them be in the hands of... Oh, oh, John. Conrad. Conrad. Oh, there. oh no, I, I was muted. Sorry, I have been muted by the Let devil. Let them be in the hands oh, of... Come, 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 Cox, get off. God's my life, where's the sexton? Let him write down that the prince's officer, Cox, come. Come, bind them, thou naughty varlet. Away, you are an ass. You are an ass. Stop. Dost thou not suspect my place? 
Dost thou not suspect my years? Oh, that he were here to write me down an ass. But masters, remember that I am an ass, though it be not written down. Yet forget not that I am an ass. No, thou villain, thou art full of piety, as that shall be proven upon thee by the good witness. I am a wise fellow, and which is more, an officer, and which is more, a householder, and which is more, as pretty a piece of flesh as any in Messina, and one that knows the law. Go to, and a rich fellow enough, go to, and a fellow that hath had losses, and one that hath two gowns, and everything handsome about him. Bring him away. Oh, that I had been writ down an ass. Yeah. If you go on thus, you will kill yourself, and tis not wisdom thus to second grief against yourself. I pray thee, cease thy counsel, which falls into my ears as profitless, as water in a sieve. Give me not counsel, nor let no comforter delight mine ear, but such as one whose wrongs do suit mine. Bring me a father that so loved his child, whose joy of her is overwhelmed like mine, and bid him speak of patience, measure his woe the length and breadth of mine, and let it answer every strain for strain, and thus for thus, and such a grief for such, and every liniment, branch, shape, and form, if one, if such a one will smile and stroke his beard, bid sorrow wag, cry him, when he should groan, patch grief with proverbs, makes misfortune drunk with candle wasters, bring yet to me. And of him will gather patience, but there is no such man. For brother, men can counsel and speak of comfort to the grief, which they themselves not feel, but tasting it. The counsel turns to passion, which before would get perceptual medicine to rage. For better strong madness in the silken thread, a charm ache with air and agony with words. No, no. Tis all men's office to speak patience to those that ring under the load of sorrow, but no man's virtue nor sufferance he to be so moral when he has shall endure the like himself. Therefore give me no counsel, my griefs crowd louder than advertisement. Therein do men from children nothing differ. I pray thee, peace. I, I will be flesh and blood, for there will never yet philosopher that could endure the two fake patiently. However, they that have writ the style of gods and, and made a push at chance and sufferance. Yet bend not all the harm upon yourself. Make those that do offend you suffer too. There thou speakest reason. Nay, I will do so. My soul doth tell me hero is belied. And that shall Claudio know, so shall the prince and all them that dishonor her. Here comes the prince and Claudio hastily. Good den, good den. Good day to you both. Here are you, my lords. We have some haste, Leonato. Some haste, my lord. Well, fare you well, my lord. Are you hasty now? Well, all is one. Nay, do not quarrel with us, good old man. He could right himself with quarreling. Some of us would lie low. Wrong him. Mary, thou dost wrong me, thou dissembler, thou... Nay. Never lay thy hand upon thy sword. I fear thee not. Mary, beshrew my hand, if it, <clears throat> if it should give your age such cause of fear. In faith, my hand meant nothing to my sword. Tush, tush, man. Never flare and jest at me. I speak not like a dotard nor a fool. As under privilege age to brag, when I have done being young or what would do, were I not old. No, Claudio, to thy head. Thou 
has so wronged my innocent child and me that I am forced to lay my reverence by and with my gray hairs and bruise of many days do challenge thee to a trial of a man. I say thou hast mine, my, belied mine innocent child. Thy slander has gone through and through her heart and she lies buried with her ancestors on on a tomb where never slander slept, save this of hers, framed by thy villainy. My villainy? Thine, Claudio, thine, I say. You say not right, old man. My lord, my lord, I'll prove it on his body if he dare, despite his nice fence and his active practice, his may of youth and blood of lustihood. Away, I will not have to do with you. Can thou so daft me? Thou hast killed my child. If thou killst me, boy, thou shalt kill a man. He shall kill two of us, and, and men indeed. But that's no matter. Let him kill one first, win me and wear me. Let him answer me. Come, follow me, boy. Come, sir boy. Come, follow me, sir boy. I'll whip you from your joining fence Nay, as I am a gentleman, I will. Brother. Content yourself. God knows I loved my niece and she is dead, slandered to death by villains that dare as well answer a man indeed as I dare take a serpent by the tongue. Boys, apes, braggarts, jacks, milksops. Brother Anthony. Hold you content. What man? I know them, yea, and what they weigh, even to the utmost scruple, scrambling out, facing fashion-monging boys that lie and cog and flout, Deprave and slander go antically, show outward hideousness, and speak off half a dozen dangerous words how they might hurt their enemies if they durst. And this is all. But brother Anthony. Come, tis no matter. Do not, new meddle, let me deal in this. Gentlemen, both, we will not wake your patience. My heart is sorry for your daughter's death, but on my honor, she was charged with nothing but th what was true and very full of proof. My lord. My lord! I will not hear you. No! Come, brother. Away. I will be heard. And shall, or some of us, will smart for it. See, see, here comes the man we went to speak. Uh, senor, what news? Good day, my lord. Welcome, senor. You are almost come to part almost afraid. We had like to have our two noses snapped off with two old men without teeth. Leonato and his brother, what thinkest thou? Had we fought, I doubt we should have been too young for them. In a false quarrel, there is no true valor. I came to seek you both. We have been up and down to seek thee. For we are high-proof melancholy and would fain have it beaten away. Wilt thou, wilt thou use thy wit? It is in my scabbard. Shall I draw it? Dost thou wear thy wit by thy side? <laughs> Never any did so, though very many have been a bed beside their wit. I will bid thee draw as we do the minstrels draw, <laughs> to pleasure us. As I am an honest man, he looks pale. Art thou sick or angry? What? Courage, man. What though care killed a cat? Thou hast meddle enough in thee to kill care. Sir, I shall meet your wit in the career, and you charge it against me. I pray you choose another subject. Nay, then give him another staff. This last was broke cross. By this light he changes more and more. I think he be angry indeed. If he be, he knows how to turn his girdle. Shall I speak a word in your ear? God bless me from a challenge. You are a villain. I just not. I will make it good how you dare, with what you dare, and when you dare. Do me right or I will protest your cowardice. You have killed a sweet lady and her death shall fall heavy on you. Let me hear from you. 
Well, I will meet you, so I may have good cheer. What? A feast? A feast? In faith, I thank him. He hath bid me to a calf's head and a capon. The which, if I do not carve most curiously, say my knife's not, shall I not find a woodcock too? Sir, your wet ample's well, it goes easily. I'll tell thee how Beatrice praised thy wit the other day. I said, thou hast a fine wit. True, she said, a fine little one. No, said I, a great wit. Right, says she, a great gross one. Nay, said I, a good wit. Just, said she, it hurts nobody. Nay, said I, the gentleman is wise. Certain, said she, a wise gentleman. Nay, said I, he hath the tongues. That I believe, said she, for he swore a thing to me on Monday night, which he forswore on Tuesday morning. There's a double tongue, there's two tongues. Thus did she, an hour together, transshape thy particular virtues. Yet at last she concluded with a sigh, thou wast the properest man in Italy. For the witch she wept, for the witch she wept heartily and said she cared not. Yea, that she did, but yet for all that. And if she did not hate him deadly, she would love him dearly. The old man's daughter told us all. All, all, and moreover, God saw him when he was hidden in the garden. But when shall we savage the bull's horns on this sensible Benedict's head? Hey, and the text underneath. Here dwells Benedict, the married man. Fare you well, boy, you know my mind. I will leave you now to your gossip-like humor. You break jests as braggarts do their blades, which God be thanked hurt not. My lord, for your many courtesies, I thank you. I must discontinue your company. Your brother, the bastard, is fled from Messina. You have among you killed sweet and innocent lady. My lord Blackbeard there, he and I shall meet. Until then, peace be with him. He is in earnest. Most profound earnest. I warrant you for the love of Beatrice. And hath challenged thee? Most sincerely. What a pretty thing man is when he goes in his doublet and hose and leaves off his wit. He is then a giant to an ape, but then is an ape a doctor to such a man. But, soft you, let me be, pluck up my heart and be sad. Did he not say my brother was fled? Stephen? If only there was some exposition. <laughs> Come, you, sir. If justice cannot tame you, she shall ne'er weigh more reasons in her balance. Nay, and you be a cursing hypocrite once. You must be looked to. Um, come on. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> How now? Two of my brother's men bound? Baraccio one? Fucking after their offense, my lord. Officers, what offense have these men done? Mary, sir, they have committed false report. Moreover, they have spoken untruths. Secondarily, they are slanderers. Sixth and lastly, they have belied a lady. Thirdly, they have verified unjust things. And to conclude, they are lying knaves. First, I ask they what they have. I ask thee what they have done. Thirdly, I ask thee what's in their offense. Sixth and lastly, why they are committed, and to conclude, what you lay to their charge. Rightly reasoned and in his own division, and by my troth, there's one meaning well suited. Who have you offended, masters, that you are thus bound to your answer? This learned constable is too cunning to be understood. What's your offense? Sweet prince. Let me go no farther to mine answer. Do you hear me? And let this count kill me. I have deceived even your very eyes. 
what your wisdoms could not discover, these shallow fools have brought to light, who in the night overheard me confessing to this man how Don John, your brother, incensed me to slander the lady hero, how you were brought into the orchard and saw me court Margaret in hero's garments, how you disgraced her when you should marry her. My villainy they have upon record, which I had rather seal with my death than repeat over to my shame. The lady is dead upon mine and my master's false accusation, and briefly, I desire nothing but the reward of a villain. Runs not this speech like iron through your blood? I have drunk poison while he uttered it. But did my brother set thee on to this? Yea, and paid me richly for the practice of it. Posed and framed of treachery, and fled he is upon this villainy. Sweet hero, now thy image doth appear in the rare semblance that I loved at first. Um, bring away the plaintiffs. By this time our sexton hath reformed, Signor Leonato, of the matter. And masters, do not forget to specify when time and place shall serve that I am an ass. <laughs> <laughs> ah, here, here comes the master. Um, uh, comes Master C and Le Senor Leonato and the sexton too. Which is the villain? Let me see his eyes. There. I, when I note another man like him, I may avoid him. Which of these is he? If you would know your wronger, look on me. Art thou the slave, with thy breath has killed mine innocent child? Hey, even I alone. No, not so, villain. Thou believest thyself so. Here stand a pair of Honorable men, a throat is fled that had a hand in it. I thank you, princess, for my daughter's death. Record it with your high and worthy deeds. It was barely done if you bethink you of it. I know not how to pray your patience. I will speak. Choose your revenge yourself. Impose me to what penance your invention can lay upon my sin, yet sin I not but in mistake. By my soul, nor I, and yet to satisfy this good old man, I would bend under any heavy weight that he'll enjoin me to. I cannot bid you my daughter live. That were impossible. But I pray you both, possess the people Messina here, how innocent she died. And if, you, and if your love can labor aught in sad invention, hang her an epitaph upon her tomb and sing it to her bones. Sing it to night. Tomorrow morning, come to my house, since you could not be my son-in-law. Be yet my nephew. My brother hath a daughter, almost a copy of my child that's dead. And she is alone, heir to both of us. Gave her the right you should have given her cousin, and so dies my revenge. Noble sir, your kindness doth bring tears for me. I raise your offer and dispose for henceforth of poor Claudio. Tomorrow, then, I will expect your coming. Tonight I take my leave. This naughty man shall face to face be brought to Margaret, who I believe was packed in all this wrong, hired to it by your brother. No, by my soul she was not, nor knew not what she did when she spoke to me. I always have been just and virtuous in anything that I do know by her. Moreover, sir, which indeed not be written down. 
under white and black. The plaintiff here did, uh, the offender did call me ass. I beseech you, let it be remembered in his punishment. And also, the watch heard them talk of one deformed. They say he wears a key in his ear and a lock hanging by it and borrows money in God's name, the which he hath used so long and never paid that now men grow hard-hearted and will lend nothing for God's sake. Pray you examine him upon that, that point. I thank thee for thy care and honest pains. Your worship speaks like a most thankful and reverend youth, and I praise God for you. There's for thy pains. God save the foundation. Go, I discharge thee of thy prisoner, and I thank thee. I leave an errant knave with your worship, which I beseech your worship to correct yourself <clears throat> for the example of others. God keep your worship. I wish your worship well. God restore you to health. I humbly give you leave to depart, and if merry meeting may be wished, God prohibit it. Come, neighbor. Until tomorrow, Lord. Until tomorrow morning, lords. Farewell. Farewell, my lords. We look for you tomorrow. We will not fail. Tonight, I mourn with Hero. Bring you these fellows on, we'll talk with Margaret. How her acquaintance grew with this lewd fellow. Pray thee, sweet mistress Margaret, deserve well at my hands by helping me to the speech of Beatrice. Margaret? Oh, Nicole? Yeah, I'm sorry. I've lost the spot. You're good. What scene are we on, y'all? Let's see. Uh, scene two, act, I don't know what. Act five, scene two. Act, act five, scene two. Act five, scene two. Okay, I'm way behind. Just a second. Sorry. <laughs> Pray the sweet mistress Margaret to serve well at my hands by helping me to the speech of Beatrice. I'm sorry. I wasn't quite there. I thought I was. If someone wants to read in, I will find the spot. You shall come over it, for in most comely truth, thou deservest it. To have no man come over me? Why, shall I always keep below stairs? Thy wit is as quick as the greyhound's mouth it catches. And yours as blunt as the fencer's foil, which hit but hurt not. Most manly wit, Margaret. It will not hurt a woman. And so I pray thee, call Beatrice. I give thee the bucklers. Give us the swords. We have bucklers of our own. Hmm. If you use them, Margaret, you must put the pikes with the vice, and they are dangerous weapons for maids. Well, well I, will I will call the actress to you, who I think hath legs. Perfect. And therefore we'll come. <laughs> the God of love that sits above and knows me and knows me how pit ugh. I mean in singing but in loving. Leander the good swimmer, Troilus the first employer of panders, and a whole bookful of these quantum carpet mangers whose names yet run smoothly in the even road of a blank verse, and they were never so truly turned over and over as my poor self in love. I mean, I cannot show it in rhyme. I tried. I could find, I could find out no rhyme to lady, but baby. 
an innocent rhyme. For scorn, horn, a hard rhyme. For school, fool, a babbling rhyme. Very ominous endings. Now, I was not born under a rhyming planet. Nor can I, nor I cannot woo in festival terms. Sweet Beatrice, wouldst thou come when I called thee? Yea, senor, and depart when you bid me. Oh, stay till then. Then is spoken, fare you well now. And yet, ere I go, let me go with what I came, which is with knowing what hath passed between you and Claudio. Only foul words, and thereupon I will kiss thee. Foul words is but foul wind, and foul wind is but foul breath, and foul breath is noisome. Therefore I will depart unkissed. Thou hast frightened the word out of his right sense so forcibly as thy wit, but I must tell thee plainly. Claudio undergoes my challenge, and either I must shortly hear from him, or I will subscribe him a coward. And I pray thee now, tell me, for which of my bad parts didst thou first fall in love with me? For them all together. Uh. <laughs> Maintain so politic a state of evil that they will not admit any good part to intermingle with them. <laughs> But for which of my good parts did you first suffer love for me? <laughs> suffer love, good, good epithet. I do suffer love indeed, for I love thee against my will. In spite of your heart, I think. Alas, poor heart. If you spite it for my sake, I will spite it for yours, for I will never love that which my friend hates. Hmm. Thou and I are too wise to woo peacefully. It appears not in this confession, there's not one wise man among 20 that will praise himself. An old, an old instance, Beatrice, that lived in the lime of good neighbors. If a man do not erect in this age his own tomb ere he dies, he shall live no longer in monument than the bell rings and the widow weeps. And how long is that, thank you? Question. Why, an hour in clamor and a Order in room, therefore it is most expedient for the wise, if Don Worm, his conscience, find no impediment to the contrary, to be the trumpet of his own virtues as I am to myself. So much for praising myself, who I myself will bear witness, is praiseworthy. And now tell me, how doth your cousin? Very ill. How do you? Very ill, too. Serve God, love me, and men. There will I leave you, too, for here comes one in haste. Madam, you must come to your uncle, yonder's old coil at home. It is proved my lady hero hath been falsely accused, the prince and Claudio mightily abused. And Don John is the author of all who is fed and gone. Will you come presently? Will you go hear this news, Signor? I will live in thy heart, die in thy lap, and be buried in thy eyes. And moreover, I will go with thee to thy uncles. This is the monument of Leonardo. Tenderest tongues was the hero that here lies. Death to the burden of her wrongs gives her fame, which never dies. So the life that died with shame is in death with glorious fame. And now there upon the tomb, praising her when I am dumb. No music, sound, and sing your solemn hymn. Song. <laughs> Pardon, goddess of night, those that slew thy virgin knight, which songs of woe round about her tomb they go. Midnight assist our moan, help us to sigh and groan heavily, heavily. Graves yawn and yield your dead. Death be uttered heavily, heavily. Now unto thy bones, good night. Yearly will I do this right. Good morrow, masters, put your torches out. The wolves have prayed, and look, the gentle day before the wheels of Phoebus 
round about dapples the drowsy east with spots of gray. Thanks to you all and leave us. Fare you well. Good morrow, masters. Each his several way. Come, let us hence and put on other weeds and then to Leonatus we will go. Hymen with luckier issue speed and this for whom we rendered up this woe. Did I not tell you she was innocent? So are the prince and Claudio who accused her. Upon the air you heard debated. But Margaret was in some fault for this, although her, although against her will, as it appears, and the true course of all question. Well, I am glad all things sort so well. And so am I, being else by fate and forced, to call young Claudio to reckoning for it. Well, daughter, and you gentlewoman all, withdraw into the chamber by yourselves, and, and when I send for you, come hither, masked. The prince and Claudio promised by this hour to visit me. You know your office, brother. You must be father to your brother's daughter and give her to young Claudio. Which I will do with confirmed countenance. Friar, I must en entreat your pains, I think. To do what, senor? To bind me or undo me, one of them. Senor Leonardo, truth it is, good senor, your niece regards me with an eye of favor. The eye my daughter lent her, tis most true. And I do with an eye of love requite her. The sight of which I think you had from me, uh, from Claudio and the Prince, but what's your will? Uh, your answer, sir, is enigmatical, but for my will, my will is your good will. May I stand with ours this day to be conjoined in the state of honorable marriage, in which, good friar, I shall desire your help. My heart, is with your liking. And my help. Here comes the prince and Claudio. Or not. <laughs> Melissa? Uh, oh shit, where are we? <laughs> What's the five, thing? <laughs> five, scene four. I know what scene we're in, but. Act five. Becca, you want it? Okay. That's you. Good, good and morrow to this fair assembly. Good morrow. Uh, no, that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> good morrow, Prince. Good morrow, Claudio. Uh, we here attend you. Are you did yet determined today to marry with my brother's daughter? A hold in my mind was she in Ethiopia. That did me as well. <laughs> <laughs> Call her forth, brother. Here's the fire ready. Good morrow, Benedict. Why, what's the matter that you have such a February face, so full of frost, of storm and cloudiness? I think he thinks upon the savage bull. Tush, fear not, man. We'll tip thy horns with gold, and all Europa shall rejoice at thee, as once Europa did at lusty Jove, when he would play the noblest beast in love. Bull Jove, sir, had an amiable low. And some such strange bull leaped your father's cow and got a calf in that same noble feet. Much like to you, for you have just his bleat. For this I owe you. Here comes other reckonings. Which is the lady I must seize upon? This same is she, and I do give you her. Why right, then, she's mine. Sweet, let me see your face. No! You shall not, uh, till you take her hand before this friar and swear to marry her. Give me your hand. Before this holy, <coughs> I am your husband, if you, like, if you like of me. And when I lived, I was your other wife. And when you loved, you were my other husband. <laughs> Another hero. <laughs> Nothing certainer. One hero died defiled, but I do live. And surely as I live, I am a maid. The former hero. Hero that is dead. She died, my lord, while whilst her slander lived. All this amazement can I qualify, when after that the holy rites are ended. I'll tell you largely of fair hero's death. Meantime, let wonder seem familiar, and to the chapel let us presently. Soft and fair friar, which is Beatrice? I answer to that name. 
What is your will? <clears throat> Do not you love me? Why no? No more than reason. Why then your uncle and the Prince Claudio have been deceived, they swore you did. Do not you love me? Troth, no, no more than reason. Why then my cousin Margaret and Ursula are much deceived, for they did swear you did. They swore that you were almost sick for me. They swore that you were well nigh dead for me. <laughs> Tis no such matter, then you do not love me? No, truly, but in friendly recompense. Come, cousin, I am sure, I am sure you love the gentleman. And I'll be sworn upon it that he loves her. There's a paper written in his hand, a halting sonnet of his own pure brain, fashioned to Beatrice. And here's another, written in my cousin's hand, stolen from her pocket, containing her affection unto Benedict. A miracle. Here's our own hands against our hearts. Come, I will have thee. But by this light, I take thee for pity. I would not deny you, but by this good day, I yield upon great persuasion, and partly to save your life, for I was told you were in a consumption. Peace, I will stop your mouth. Aww. How Aww. dost thou, Benedict, the married man? I'll tell thee what, Prince. The College of Whitcrackers cannot flout me out of my honor. Dost thou think I care for a satire or an epigram? No. If a man will be beaten with brains and shall wear nothing handsome about him, in brief, since I do purpose to marry, I will think nothing to any purpose that the world can say against it. And therefore, Never flout at me for what I have said against it. For man is a guinea pig. And this is my conclusion. For thy part, Claudio, I did think to have beaten thee, but in that thou art like to be my kinsman. Live unbruised and love my cousin. I well hope thou wouldst have denied Beatrice that I might have cudgeled thee out of thy single life to make thee a double dealer, which, out of question, thou wilt be, if my cousin did not look exceedingly narrow to thee. Come, come, we are friends. Let's have a dance that we are married, that we may lighten our own hearts and our wives' heels. Well, we'll have dancing afterward. First of my word, if we'll play music, Prince, thou art sad. Get thee a wife. Get the a wife. There is no staff more reverend than one tip with her. My lord, your brother John is taken in flight and brought with armed men back to Messina. Think not on him till tomorrow. I'll devise the brave punishments for him. Strike up, pipers. Yay! Yay. <laughs> die no more, ladies, die no more. Men were deceivers ever. One for you. I just want to wish, 
Rebecca, Ooh. a very happy yes. birthday. Thank you. And happy anybody birthday. else who has had a birthday that maybe we have not, who else has had a birthday? I know there's a lot of Aries in the theater. <laughs> <laughs> Raise your hand. To Rebecca. Happy Me. birthday to Rebecca. Over the cat. <laughs> so, Rebecca, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Rebecca. Yeah. Happy birthday to you. We should get a birthday to you. Birthday to you. Zoom, nobody been together. Terribly organized. Did Talia and Browns. <laughs>